looking good. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I, I froze again on my screen. There we go. Okay. Hey. Oh, yeah. There we are. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Are we cooking with gas? <laughs> we are cooking with gas. Yay. Okay. Uh, hey. Okay. Hey, it's that song by uh, Eric Clapton. When you're in the woods and you need some fire, propane. <laughs> <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> Is that the Bob Dylan version? That could be. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Happy Halloween, first of all. Ooh. And, uh, ooh, yeah, pretty scary faces here, these two guys. So take your mask off, guys. <laughs> Should have known. Should have known. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday Night Offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. My name is Chris Kerwin of Astronomy by the Bay, and uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome back our two regular co-hosts, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton, New Brunswick. Hey, Paul. Hello. Hey. And Mr. Stormtrooper. Stormtrooper. <laughs> oh, no, he's a stormtrooper, not the yeah. Mike Powell That's from the BFO Mike. Observatory here in St. John. Hey, Mike. He's Darth Vader in Burnett. Inverted, yeah. <laughs> How'd you guess? Oh boy. I'll give me one of them shows. Okay, so tonight on episode number 101. Yay! Hey. Yay. Oh, it's just sick. My head's a circle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so you're out capturing some nice sky images. You return home with all this data or data, or whatever you want to call it, I don't care. Uh, how, how do you best manipulate, I don't care about this stuff. How do you best manipulate the data in software? Well, Paul's going to try and take us, uh, take some of the mystery out of that process for us here tonight. Uh, Paul will also return a little later with another Rosanna's Fun Facts segment. And Mike will bring back his Bino Bud as he reveals his newest binocular target of the week. Um, if there's time, I'm going to provide a little look at what's up in the night sky coming up this week. There's just a few slides I have. Uh, should be pretty short. And since a lot of you were out last night trying to catch the aurora, mm. I have, yeah, I have a number of your wonderful photos here to share as well. So sit back, folks, grab your favorite beverage or snack and enjoy. And remember, this is a family-friendly live broadcast. So if you have any questions about the night sky or astronomy equipment, we're here to help answer your questions. So let's get started with tonight's program. Good evening, everybody, out on YouTube and Facebook. Where are our costumes? Well, we're wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're pretending to be the Sunday Night Astronomy host. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, Paul. You've been doing that for 101 shows. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's go to... Um, we're going to go to where first. We're going to go with you first, Paul, yes? Me? Yeah, you're already? Right. Sure. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, this is going to be just an informal, um, uh, I, I don't even know if I'd even call it presentation, but um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what it takes to, when you're doing your imaging, I guess, is to, is to take some of the mystery out of trying to learn every tool. Mike and I were just talking about that just before we come on and about how sometimes you get stuck on a tool and then you try to learn this tool, that tool, this tool. And sometimes the tool that you're stuck on is the one that you have to have um, uh, under control before you can move on to any of the other stuff. So really, uh, it's all really about developing a workflow and how many steps do I need to go from taking my raw image or my fit file if I'm using a one shot color camera to a picture that I can put on Facebook or whatever my social media stream is to share with my friends. And uh, surprisingly enough, it's not that many steps and it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, what is the flow to that? Now, the, um, <coughs> the software choice for me uh, now is PixInsight, but before that it was uh, Photoshop. And I was getting pretty good with Photoshop. I was starting to learn a lot of the things but I found, um, you know, in some cases I was getting bogged down too because of a lot, a lot of the steps that you had to take to to do a function. Um, uh, GIMP has been around. Mike's using GIMP now. I actually, there's a lot of people that are using GIMP and have an absolutely wonderful success with it. But it is very, very similar to Photoshop. So a lot of the Photoshop people have moved over to GIMP. Um, there's a lot more 
um, astrophotography support in GIMP, I believe, than there is in, uh, in Photoshop, although you can go online and find all the different things you can do. But there's a lot of plugins that you can get as well, which helps with a lot of the tasks that we take on. And it seems the more that we move forward, um, there's more and more of these plugins, uh, plugin being something that you can put into your tool set and instead of you having to go through this layer, that button, select this, modify that, go here, go there, go there, just to do one function, you basically put in this um, plug-in and you press one button and it does all those steps for you. Um, uh, there's a new um, uh, tool on the market now from RC Astro, and that's the, the folks that gave you uh, the gradient exterminator. And they call this one the star exterminator. And what it does, it actually takes the stars and removes them from your image. It allow you to put those stars somewhere in the corner. And then when you want to put those stars back in, uh, you can do that. Or some people like to have a starless image. To do that um, in Photoshop, uh, it can be done. And once you know the steps and if you've got them memorized in your, in your, in your mind, then you can actually go through and do that. But with Star Exterminator, one button. Push the button, and in a matter of in less than a minute, I timed it. In less than a minute, uh, you can have a starless image and stars. Uh, the advantages to that, of course, is A, some people like starless images, so it's a very simple one button push to do it. Or B, uh, it's nice to be able to take your stars off if, you, if you're satisfied with the way your stars look and you want to work on the structures within your image, then uh, it makes it a lot easier to do that, especially on backgrounds. For me personally, I find by taking my stars off, I can really get a really good look at the background without having to try to peek through all those stars, even though they might be masked and all that stuff, they're still there. And uh, But with this exterminator, um, you can actually take them right off. Now that star exterminator uh, works on uh, Photoshop. You can buy a version for Photoshop. I'm assuming GIMP, but I could be wrong. I won't, I won't don't hold me to that. And um, and uh, and for PixInsight, and, and I, I I've downloaded downloaded it on PixInsight, and it works really really well. Anyway, so uh, make a long story short, uh, what I want to talk to, to you tonight about is is how can we simplify things and uh, and make them not so confusing or not so much like they're. A, a mountain that you just can't get over. So I'm going to open up um, my Pix Insight um, screen and then hopefully be able to share that with you. And I want to show you just basically what it is that I do uh, for my workflow that, um, that kind of makes sense for me. So I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's see here. Our screen, that should be it right there. And let me know when you uh, see that. Yeah, you're up. You're yeah? Good. Okay. Yep. So um, with processing, um, and I'll, I'll probably get some of the stuff, but this is actually on my main screen. So excuse the, uh, the little messages you may see. Um, for what I've done and what I've learned to do in um, any kind of image processing, is to take these little bite size um, stabs at stuff I need to learn. I figured out that what is the first thing that I need to do in my picture, and then I'll do that. And that's the most important thing I need to learn. What is the next thing I need to do in my picture? And I'll learn that because that is the next, that's the most important thing I need to learn. So you can see where I'm going with this. It's basically developing a workflow. So this is the first thing I do, this is the second thing I do. This is the third thing I do. So if you look at, um, at my desktop here, this isn't the one I use all the time. This is just one I did from before. But you'll see a whole bunch of tools, <clears throat> excuse me, um, all going down one side of my desktop. These are basically the tools that I would use in my workflow. So the very first thing I do is I do what they call a dynamic crop, which is a crop in your image. So if I wanted to maybe, you know, if I say, for example, had uh, some... Um, uh, uh, stacking artifacts on my images because when you stack a bunch of pictures together, sometimes they don't stack quite straight, and then you end up getting some funny uh, look, funny looking things on the outside lines. So basically, then I would just take a dynamic crop, just click on my crop tool. It opens up, and if I wanted to, 
I could shrink the picture down. And, and so if I had a whole bunch of uh, bad stuff here, you know, maybe some start stacking artifacts like lines or just stuff that for some reason I just didn't want in the image, then I could crop it down. So that would be the first thing that I would do. So you'll notice that, and I'm just going to cancel that because I don't want to crop this picture, but um, there we go. So, so that would be a dynamic crop. So that's the very first thing I do in every one of the photos that I do. So how long does it take to learn to crop? Well, crop's a pretty simple tool. Uh, in Photoshop, it's called crop. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. So basically, that's what you would do so after you've got your image there. Now, depending if you're using a one-shot color camera um, or a mono camera where you're taking a whole bunch of different pictures, uh, either way, you're going to have things that are you're going to have to stack, and you're going to have a final master image. And on that master image, chances are there's going to be things you're going to want to take out on the edges. If you can't see it before you go any further, blow up your picture, have a look around because sometimes those things will rear themselves. In Photoshop, they rear themselves when you're looking at your histogram as another spike before your main, uh, um, your main histogram. And that other spike are those funny artifacts that, that shouldn't be there. So as soon as you clean those out with a crop, that funny spike disappears. And now you've got a nice clean looking histogram. So, so there's your first tool, step one. That's one step. I'm gonna write this down as we go and um, see exactly how many steps there is. So first step, crop the image. There's one step. The next thing I do, um, again, with this particular software, is I do a background noise reduction, or sorry, a, a background um, equalization, which is called dynamic background extraction. So if there's like gradients on the picture, you know, one corner is kind of, uh, Mike was talking about this today. We saw one of the images that I did and there was one corner that was a little not colored right compared to the rest of it. And that was my fault because I didn't do any calibration. I just wanted to try a camera and see how it would work. Uh, but that is one thing is called a, a gradient. So there's a spot on there that's either lighter or darker or maybe the wrong color and you want to clear that up, right? Um, and the other things you want to get rid of uh, would be like your corners if they're, if you've got um, vignetting going on, which would be darkening in the corners. Uh, so that's what the background extraction does. So it basically gives you a nice, even, smooth background to start your image on because you don't want to do that five, six, seven steps down the road because you're going to be fighting that the whole time. Every time you do a step, you're going to be fighting with those things. You want to clean those things up as best you can. So that would be step number two, your background extraction. So that would be the next tool that I would learn. And then uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to color calibrate my image. I want to make sure that my red, my blue, and my green are all lined up so that they, so that they have even distribution, especially in the background, because you want your background a certain black. You don't want it tinted to the blue or the, the red or the green. You want to have that all balanced up. So that would be step number three. So far, all of these three steps would take me probably about five minutes to do. So you can see that once you get used to using the tools, they're actually quite simple and easy steps. And I do these with every image. Um, from there, um, I'm going to do what we call this one. This tool is called multi-scale linear transfer. All that is is just a fancy way of saying this is a noise reduction tool. So I want to take some of that noise out because every picture that we take is going to have a certain amount of noise that we want to get rid of. Because it's like the same as if you took a family picture and you took somebody, a Uncle Joe sitting on the couch, but it was dark. And then you look at it, Uncle Joe looks all grainy, right? So that's the same as when you're taking astrophotos because you're dealing with a lot of dark stuff. So you want to get rid of that noise so it's a nice, smooth looking image. You don't want something that's all speckly because it'll just look absolutely terrible. So that's step number four. One, two, three, four. And then from there, uh, what I would do is then I would do um, what they call an image stretch. In other words, I'm taking my image from a black, as you see it, in a linear form, and I'm actually stretching it so I can see. The difference between PixInsight and Photoshop is when you're working in Photoshop, your, um, your very first step is that stretching process. With PixInsight, these few steps I'm talking to you about are actually just taking stuff away taking away noise, taking away gradients, taking away um, vignetting, um, you know, um, taking away color imbalance. These are all takeaway tools. 
when I get to the point where I stretch it from that point moving forward, it's just adding on. And all I'm going to add on is maybe some sharpness or I'm going to add on some color or I'm going to add on some dynamic range or things like that. So that's really the, the simplicity of it. So once I've got the point, gotten to the point where the image is now uh, nonlinear, in other words, I've stretched it permanently, that's the way the image is and it's stretched. Then I move on to uh, uh, another form of noise reduction, because once you stretch, most of the times there is a little bit of noise still left over. So I would clean up that noise and that would be um, with on this particular um, a software, it's called TVG to noise, and it'll take away noise in both uh, color uh, blotch areas, and it'll also take care of noise and lightness areas. Once I've got that done, that's step number one, two, three, four, oh, six. six. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. That's step number six. And then from there, um, it's just, I call it salt and pepper. Now I'm just going to work with the image. Uh, I want more, um, say, contrast in the image. I want, you know, I want my dark areas a little darker. I want my bright areas a little brighter. I want that image to pop for me. So that would uh, happen in a couple of tools. Uh, you can do um, local histogram equalization, which is really basically it's a contrast adjustment. And then once I've got that done, so that was step number seven, correct? Yeah. Then I'm going to just put in the colors I like. So I'm just going to take my curves transformation and you can do the same thing with color saturation or, or curves with Photoshop. It's the same thing. And this would be some, getting close to some of the final steps that I would do in an image. I do a lot more, you know, as I've gotten into this, but for someone who is just starting out, these would be the basic things that you're going to want to take an image from a black image, right on up to something that, okay, this actually is done. It's mitigated of noise. Uh, the colors are nice. I've taken care of the background. It looks good. Um, I've kept an eye on my stars, so they look nice and and and, uh, and clean. And and that's it. So once I've done the curves transformation, um, then I would just simply save it as a JPEG or save it as a TIFF, put it in my computer, and then share away to my friends. So how many steps was that? Eight. Yeah. Eight steps. So essentially, <clears throat> for those people getting into astrophotography and they want to use PixInsight, they want to start with that, there are a whole bunch of other things you will do in between a lot of these steps that I have not discussed, but those are for people that are a little bit more advanced and when they get into their workflow, they'll develop those things. But if you just want to get in there and get the satisfaction to keep this hobby enjoyable, because the, the, the first reason that you go out and buy a camera and a telescope and put it in your yard and spend all that money and then learn how to use your telescope and camera and be able to capture you know, nice clean data with good round stars uh, is because you wanna take that, it, that data and you wanna put it in the form of a picture that you can be proud to show your friends. I mean, that's really what we do, right? Uh, or if you just wanna you know, do it for your own specific uh, satisfaction and you put, hang them on your wall and you can look back at them, whatever it is you wanna do with it, um, it should be enjoyable. So by taking on too much at once, trying to learn everything that you can possibly learn in a software, don't do that. Just learn the basic steps that you need to get your picture from black to a photo. And in this case here, we can do it in eight steps. So if you can learn um, basically eight tools uh, in Photoshop, you are sorry, in um, uh, uh, PixInsight, you've developed a workflow. And you'll notice on the side here that uh, on mine, I've got a whole, you know quite a few other ones that are in there. But then again, there's other things that I would do down the road with the images. You know, if I want to create, um, uh, like if I've got a one-shot color camera and I really want to make, you know, the image pop and really sharp and crisp and all that kind of stuff, well, then I would create um, a luminance, a synthetic luminance image. And then basically I would treat that the same way I treat it, uh, the picture that we're talking about here, what, the steps that we just went through. And then I would put that uh, right over top of the color picture. And you won't believe what you can come up with, but I wouldn't try to do that right away. Like that's something you'll learn down the road. So um, so again, it's just little victories. So the first thing is how how to learn to do a crop. A crop. crop is, I think anybody can do a crop. Anybody who's got a cell phone does crops already. When they take a picture with their cell phone, 
they crop it in and they put it on Facebook or whatever it is, wherever they put it. So that's an easy one. Uh, background extraction in Photoshop, uh, there is a, a set of tools you can buy called Astronomy Tools, it's called Astronomy Tool Set. And it's got about 50, um, uh, uh, what do we call them, uh, plugins built in to there, 50 tools built into that plugin. And there's noise reduction, one push of a button. There is star shrinking, the push of a button. There is uh, make stars brighter, make stars smaller, uh, make uh, nebula more intent and back off the stars. These are all very, very um, easy things to do because they're push of a button. It's a tool set. I think I paid, I'm going to say $50 for it. But when I was working in Photoshop, um, I used that all the time because that was kind of my tools that I have now in PixInsight. Uh, some of the plugins and stuff that I use. But so if you want to get, you know, these things, uh, you know, again, that are easy to do. As a matter of fact, let me just show you uh, in Photoshop what I'm talking about. I'm going to pop this over here. I'm assuming you can see that. So um, if you go into um, window and it's called actions. And then right here it says astronomy tools. So here I could do all of these things. I can put star diffraction spikes. So if, I, if I'm the kind that likes those crosses on the stars, I can put them in um, in a few different ways. Um, if I want to enhance my DSO and reduce the stars, I can do that. If I want to um, uh, reduce the space noise reduction, this is the background reduction, like I'm talking about here, the DBE. This is basically a push of one button here and it reduced this, uh, what they call uh, noise, space noise reduction or deep space noise reduction. This is more of the background kind of noise reduction. This is almost a little bit more overall noise reduction. Make the star smaller. We were talking earlier, Mike and I, about shrinking stars. Here it is uh, in a push of a button. So this whole tool set you can buy as a plug-in for uh, Photoshop and it's called Astronomy Tools. And uh, I tell you, it, it will work wonders for you. Uh, and you really don't have to do anything but other than push a button. And do I like the result or do I not like the result? And it's just that simple. So if you look at um, some of these plugins and, and they're getting more and more and more uh, that are out there, these one button push solutions. And if, and if you want to get some instant gratification and not frustrate yourself to death because you know, there's one button that you just never keep pushing on that tool and it's the one that makes the difference and you don't find that out until about you know 30 tries later oh if i don't only know it was that one button <laughs> you can save that frustration and uh, you can just go ahead and use this kind of a tool set if you're using photoshop and have all of these wonderful things happen to your image at the push of a button so um so i just wanted to just take and just talk a little bit about these tools and a little bit about um, about how people are always talking that, you know, Photoshop uh, is such a steep learning curve, and it is, um, if you're trying to learn everything at once. Pix and Sight is such a steep learning curve, and it is, if you're trying to learn everything at once. What you need to do is figure out what are the most key essential tools that I need to be able to create an image that I can place wherever it is I want to place, print it or put it on the internet, whatever. And what are the simple steps that I can do that will actually get me there? Once you do that, you will have immediate success. You will feel that the money that you invested in your equipment uh, is justified. You'll be pounding your chest saying, look what I did. Like Tom Hanks when he made fire on Castaway. I made fire. And trust me, you'll have those moments. Um, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, that's what you need to do. Break it into those steps. Find out the key things you need to do. Work on those get those first couple of pictures. And then from there, start fine tuning and start learning other tools. So that would be my advice to anybody getting into uh, processing uh, into astrophotography. Awesome, Paul. Yeah. Great Perfect. Points. Great points. Yep. As Dan, Dan says, master the basics first, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so you can send all your photos to uh, Paul Owen. Oh. <laughs> and he'll practice with them and uh, send you back when yeah. he's done. Because <laughs> he needs to practice, so, yeah. I do. <laughs> uh, Renat asked, uh, which image do you ultimately store? 
which image do I ultimately store? Your final um, one. <laughs> the last one, yeah. <laughs> that um, would be my guess. Huh? I, I'm, I'm guessing she's wondering if it's, is it a JPEG, is it a TIFF, is it, yeah. is it that? Maybe she can answer that question. I can answer Yeah, her. I can wait, wait for her to respond. Yeah, because I'm not sure that what she's asking. Uh, have you tried non-astro images with the star tools? Do you work in layers? Um, okay, so how the star tools work is they do actually work in layers. And uh, so when you uh, activate, let's say we wanted to do a star shrink or something like that, what will happen is when you're in Photoshop, you'll open up this star tool, you'll press on that one particular command that you want to do, and then on the bottom of star tools, there's a little play button. You simply hit the play button, it'll automatically do everything it's supposed to, and when it's done, it'll show up in the form of a layer uh, where, you, where your layers are. It'll actually pop itself right there. And then from that point, you can decide... Do I want to keep that um, uh, adjustment or do I not want to keep that adjustment? And like all of layers in Photoshop, you've got the little slider, the opacity slider. So not only can you apply that to your image, but you can, you can apply it in a percentage from zero to 100. So maybe 100 is too strong, maybe 60 is too weak, and maybe 75 is just that sweet spot for that particular adjustment. So there is that kind of fine tuning that you can do um should you decide that you want to do it with that but so yes it does work in layers and that's basically how it works in layers okay the one of one other comments she made is not format undo is what she's question that's a question i guess okay format undo you would use um if you chose that you didn't want the layer you can just undo the step if you want but it's a pain in the foot because you got to remember when you're using a tool like this it's actually creating a whole, it's going through a whole bunch of things. It's masking, it's doing a whole bunch of functions. So um, it's actually, you would use control Z to, to turn it on. And if you don't want it, you can just take that layer. If, if for, from whatever reason, you, you just don't want it, you can grab that layer and throw it in the trash. And then that layer is gone. Okay. I can, I can, I, I'll, I'll maybe on another show, I'll demonstrate that sure. little tool set and then show you actually how, you, how to use it and how I've used it in layers and how it uh, uh, worked in the workflow. Okay. And our last question here was, does it do animation? Animation. Uh, like video, like move. Overture, <laughs> turn the lights. This is it. My the nights. Rehearsing <laughs> and nursing at birth. We know we're part by heart. <laughs> no. <laughs> we, we do the animation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It does not. No, it does no not. there's okay. no animation in astro astronomy tools. Okay. Um, <laughs> Corinne is asking, is it astronomy tools action set? It so, is. Let me just look it up okay. again here for you. Just pardon me for one second. It is called... Oh, I just turned it off. Uh, actions. Astronomy tools. It's just called astronomy tools. Um, the one the version I have, I haven't updated mine, but mine is version 1.6. I'm sure they've uh, <laughs> improved it since then. But just look up astronomy tools for Photoshop, and and it should come right to the uh, if you want to download it because they do they do have a, a, a trial download. Okay. Yep. Uh, she said in science you typically would want to uh, want the original data recorded somewhere, so you do keep the original as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Like the thing with the thing with anything when you're working in layers, uh, especially with Photoshop, if that's what we're talking about, um, you're going to have your original um, master um, uh, uh, frame, right? In other words, the one that you've downloaded and stacked, and that's your master light frame. It's all ready to go. It's been calibrated and everything. That's the picture you're going to work on, starting from a black image. Before you do that, um, you can either save that one. Or in most cases, that will be in a file anyway. So even if you lost it on Photoshop, it does not also take out the original file that you would have stored somewhere on your computer, wherever you store your files. So, so yeah, so there. If you want to save an image as you're working through the workflow, well, then uh, with, with any of the softwares, you can save that image at any point in time. Also in Photoshop and in PixInsight, there's also a history that you can actually go back to. And you can actually go in and out of that history so that if there's a very specific spot that you think you might have went wrong, or maybe your picture just gone wonky and you're just kind of pulling your hair out, um, then you can actually just start going backwards in the steps to 
to the point that you found, okay, this is where uh, I was good into this point. And then from there, you can start working ahead again. So, so there's uh, so you can save your picture at that point again. So in case you do something permanent or you do a, you know, a function that ter- uh, t- uh, permanently makes a, a change on it, then you've got that saved. Um, so yeah, it's good to save it, you know, at it's in stages, if that was, if that's the case. So, so, but your original image, if that was the original question should always be in your computer, you're only taking it when you open it on something else, it's still always in your computer unless you're moving it. Yeah. Just yeah. don't overwrite it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the last question she had was, uh, any suggestion for a good file system? Yeah. Well, um, what I've learned over time is to have one main file storage house for your astronomy stuff. And in within that one, then you can break down your files uh, to, to however, however you want to store them. But when you're writing information say, from Pixon site, I'll use that as an example, um, at the end of everything, so at the end of it, if I, want, if I want to save my project and go back to it, or if I just want to save my picture, I'll actually save it in the same place that I saved um, all of my uh, raw files. So that that whole project is within one file. I just open up that file and all the, whatever it is I might want to do with the pieces and parts in it, then I can do it. But I always know where all those particular pertaining files are, which would be in that one. I always found that all my files on my computer system are set up just like the card catalog at a library. They're alphabetical order. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is front to back. Yeah. And it's exactly like using the card catalog at the library. Yep. And that way I can go to anything I want in an instant and know exactly where it's at, not have to search through screens and screens to find it. Yep. And yeah. you get used to using a system like that, and boy, I'll tell you, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, it depends on, on your system and on yeah. your um, how you organize. If you're somebody who's super organized and have been around computers and maybe work computers a lot, you'll certainly have a system. That question probably wouldn't need to be asked. But if you're like me, someone who just kind of hacked your way through it and and by trial and error, you figured out ways that, okay, this is where I put things and I know I won't lose them. How many times have we said, I'm going to take this gadget and put it in this safe spot where I know where it is. And then you never found that safe spot again, right? Right. So, um, but once you develop that, because usually when you're working with astronomy and astrophotography, when you're working on a project, it's usually, you know, like M31 behind me. So I know where that, all that stuff is. I'll put on the file M31 in the date that I actually did that image. And then that way there, if I lose it, I can search it a couple of different ways. I can search by date, search by name, and that kind of stuff. All right. Awesome. Good information. A lot of good comments here. So, yeah, great information for everybody. Thanks, Paul. Good. Uh, let's get Paul's vocal cords a rest for a few minutes. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to we're gonna move on to Mike. But as soon as I mention uh, hello to Danny out there, our Number one fan, my little brother. So we had to say hello. Hey, to how you doing, Danny? Hey, Danny. <laughs> Told him I would tonight. So, okay, <laughs> and let's move on to a bino bud then. Oh, we got a bino bud. Yay! We're gonna pull him up here. Oops. Hey, church. I'm to you. So, because it is Halloween night. <laughs> we have binocular target of the week by Halloween Bud. <laughs> He's caught the shower curtain. <laughs> so our bino target of the week this week is the smiley face. <laughs> you say, what is a smiley face? Well, Auriga comes across as a big pentagon rising in the northeast sky with a bright star capella at the top corner. After roughly estimating where the center of the pentagon is, scan the area below and to the right of the central point with binoculars. Very quickly will you come across an arc of seven bright stars that comes into view looking just like a big smile, and above this are two eyes. So, where do I find it in the sky? If you go outside, Nine o'clock, I set this one for and look 65 degrees east northeast. You will look over and you will see probably the Pelides. You will see Taurus. And Taurus actually comes over and touches uh, Araja. And you'll see the bright star Capella. So you come down about three quarters of the way. And right in this central section is where you'll find the smiley face. 
A little closer look, you can actually start to see the smile right here in a ride. You got M36 and M38, and the smile is right in between the two. And if uh, here's a shot that somebody took, a little blurry because of guiding, but guess what? There it is. One, two, three, the big smile. <laughs> and two eyes. eyes. <laughs> yeah. And it is 100% noticeable. It'll pop right out on you, and you'll catch M38 and M36 in the same field of view. In 10 by 50 binoculars, look. There it is. Stands right out. Can't miss it. Yes, sir. Here's the two eyes and a great big smile, the smiley face. Comparing it to the full moon, oh, it's probably three full moons across. So it's a good size. Not hard to find at all. And like I said, you'll get lucky if you're in a little of the darker skies and you'll pick off those two Messier objects at the same time. Darn that funding. <laughs> yeah, that was the story last night. <laughs> was it ever? <laughs> but I have to look at the, the northern lights and what did we get? City lights. <laughs> And that's our <laughs> not get our bud target of the week. Awesome. Hey, I know, bud. Another great one, Mike. Another great one. Thanks, buddy. I love it. All right, yeah. We don't we don't know these until Mike brings them out on the show. So uh, they're they're great to look forward to. Glad everybody likes yeah. them too out there. Um, yeah. Um, I wonder if we can get the cowboy. I wonder if you know what what I mean by the cowboy. Oh yeah, oh. Where's the cowboy hat. Yeah, I don't know if you can, it's in the double cluster. That should fit in the box. I'll have to look them up one of these days and yeah, take, take a see look what we cow, get. Cowboy in the double cluster. Yeah, it'd be kind of cool. Anyway, okay, that's great. Thanks, uh, Mike, for that. Another great target to get out and shoot. Uh, shoot or... With binoculars, yeah. Yeah, shoot with binoculars. There you go. <laughs> um, we got some photos to go through. Uh, Paul, do you want to do your Rosanna now, or do you want to uh, um, wait for a bit? Up to you. Whatever you want. You're, 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 oh. ca you're captaining this you're captaining okay. well, ship. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll take two minutes and go over what's coming up this week. Perfect. Okay. Um, because I wanted to mention a couple of things that are kind of neat that, uh, I want to be sure I get through them, but hang on a second. Oh, I don't want that one. Let's bring it over this way. Yeah, I'll bring it up here first, whatever. Slide show from beginning. I'll probably get the screens flipped backwards. Oh, there we go. That's good. Okay. Just a quick view of what's up this week. I only found a few things that were really kind of different this week uh, but so I'm going to move way ahead to Wednesday actually not much happening Monday and Tuesday but I don't think we have a clear sky anyway so on Wednesday we've got Mercury Spica and our moon now Spica is the main star in uh, Virgo down here and we got a waning crescent moon just down to one percent illuminated and we've got Mercury Spica and the moon making a nice triangle uh, east looking east at 7 a.m. Uh, so that's on Wednesday uh, but here, too, uh, if you're right there at the right time, at 7.01, you're going to catch the ISS passing right by. And so it comes from Arcturus up this way and comes right down through the shot. So catch that one, and that's kind of neat. Um, Mercury and Spike and our moon, just 1% illuminated, form a nice celestial triangle in our eastern morning sky on Wednesday. And uh, let's move on to our next one. Okay, so there's, here's a really tough one. This is a real challenge. Uh, so try and catch the moon as it passes in front of Mercury in the daytime sky. So the moon is going to actually occult Mercury. So Mercury is going to pass, well, it'll pass in front of Mercury. So you lose Mercury view altogether. Um, and you're only going to get to see it pass in front. You're not going to get to see it pop out the other side because the moon will, will have set by that time. But again, uh, be extra cautious because the sun is only 15 degrees away. Uh, so that would be about three widths of your fist. So if you're going to check it out with binoculars or a telescope, be very careful. Uh, maybe have the sun in an area that is behind some trees or behind a building or something like that so that you don't accidentally, you know, scoot your scope over and blind yourself. Um, but it's a kind of a neat little target to, to try. It doesn't happen that often for, uh, uh, in front of Mercury. So a little tiny Mercury uh, with a very, very slim crescent moon. And this is just the one day before uh, the moon turns new. So uh, the time now is from 4.43 until 5.38. But I think by 5.38, the moon is down. So, But nice little challenge right there. Uh, again, be very careful. Um, on Thursday, Uranus is that opposition. Now, that means that we have the sun, Earth, and Uranus all in the line. So when the sun sets, Uranus rises, and 
the sun rises, Uranus sets. Uranus is very difficult to find in the night sky just by looking out. You're not going to see it naked eye unless you know exactly where to look. But you can pick it out with binoculars and a small telescope. And it's going to appear just like a soft bluish little green ball. Um, now, you can use Cetus, the whale, here as your guide. So Mike was talking about uh, um, Taurus in here. Here's the Pleiades up here. And if we just take Cetus, though, and we take these two stars in Cetus and go straight out and just double that distance, it should be right in that area. So you're not looking for a pinpoint star. You're looking for a little soft kind of a ball, bluish green in color. Now, you know, you're not going to see much, but remember that it's 19 times farther away from the sun than we are. So it's quite a ways out there. Saturn is the farthest target you can see with your naked eye, set the farthest planet. Um, but this one's kind of neat to be able to pick out. Um, Thursday also is a new moon, so uh, there's no moon in our sky, so I mean this is where our moon is, is and so the sun's over here to the right hand side. Uh, and when we've got no moon in the sky, it's a great time to be out looking for deep sky objects, those deep sky treasures that we all enjoy. Uh, you get a chance for your eyes to dark adapt a little bit better. Um, the moon doesn't wash out all that, all that uh, piece of the sky, and that's going to be nice. Uh, I mean, this is Thursday, so right through till uh, sometime middle next week before the moon becomes a, a, an issue for us. So get out there on Thursday and get some uh, deep sky treasures knocked off your list. Uh, Friday, <clears throat> here's an interesting one, a transit of Io. So little tiny Io, um, we've got the four of the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and Io's the smallest one, and it's the one that's in closest. And it is a very volcanic world, um, produces a whole lot of uh, sulfur on the surface as well. And we're going to be able to see, if you have a, a decent-sized telescope, you're going to be able to see uh, Io transiting across the face of Jupiter. Now, it's, it's so tiny that it takes quite a while for it to happen. So from 642 to 859 will be the length of time it will take to cross the full face of Jupiter. But also, there's also a shadow transit. So as Io is crossing uh, Jupiter, it'll have to be a little bit more than halfway across before its shadow starts to collect on Jupiter. And that's a little bit easier to see. You get to see the contrast a little bit better that way. So you can follow the shadow from 801 to 1018. So an extra two hours, more than two hours for, the, for that shadow to cross the face of Jupiter. And right here in the corner, little Ganymede is peeking out around the corner too at that same time. This is right at uh, 815. So. <clears throat> so it might be a good opportunity to get out, get some clear sky. Not that late at night, eight o'clock, not bad. Uh, I'm going to move ahead now to Sunday, and we got all this, right? Hey, fall back. Sunday time change. Time to change the time. Uh, fall back one hour for an extra hour of darkness. Yay! Extra hour of darkness. Yay! <laughs> Nobody else is saying yay. <laughs> um, and uh, also those... Mike and I have a smiley face on. There you go, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, you can so get out there and see it sooner. If you don't want to get <laughs> depressed over the fact that uh, that the the, uh, the sky is getting darker sooner, um, you got a nice little treat here Sunday. We'll have the moon and Venus together. Little crescent moon. They're always pretty when you get that little crescent with the earth shine and bright Venus. Uh, only four degrees away, so uh, pretty pretty tight. They'll fit together in a field of binoculars. Uh, that's the second and the third brightest objects in our sky. Uh, both are beautiful in binoculars, and it's a great little photo op. So uh, get out and take a look at that Sunday night once you see the dark sky. And I wanted to mention again, Lisa's look up for November. Lisa has this chart up for November on her page, uh, her Facebook page. And down this page, is, it's, uh, it's excellent because she has all of those events that I mentioned and many more for the whole month. Uh, she'll pick the dates out, the best time, the peak time to be able to see them. Here she's got three little symbols. There's an eyeball set of eyeballs, binoculars, and a telescope. And depending on what the object is, you'll get the chance to see <coughs> any, any combination of those three. So you can find Lisa at uh, Ruby Moonbeams. That's her site, but it's called Lisa's Lookup, Astronomy and More. And that's about it for tonight. Okay. Sorry about that there. In the slideshow. <laughs> Yeah, Lisa's uh, Lisa's page is really awesome. Um, it is. Yep. I've looked at it a few times, and it's just if you want to find stuff, like you don't, there's no guessing on anything. No. 
No, you, you know, don't. you look at it and it tells you if you're going to use binoculars or telescope or yeah. naked eye. Oh, yeah. That's when great. it's up, where it's up, just get the month laid out. Yep. Fantastic. So great at least to, look up. to print yeah. off and, and have uh, have a side. Put it on your fridge. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Print off. Put it on your fridge. Every time you're going for a moon pie, look at these. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't uh, share my screen. Did that all come out? I guess you guys saw. Yeah, it. No, it did. Yeah. Okay. It did. No, you did. Yeah, we didn't see it here. Oh, okay. but I checked it out. It was on. It was broadcast. So. Okay. All right. Good. Well, we've got uh, we got a Rosanna talk, and we have um, some photos after that, so that'll wind all up right. our night. All right. Well, let's get uh, let's get this all set up. Uh, all right. Let's see if I can do this correctly. And we'll start with this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Yay! Hi, <laughs> right, welcome back, Rosanna. We missed you last week. Yes. We, uh, we didn't forget about you, and uh, and certainly uh, we were certainly celebratory in your affiliation with us, and we really appreciate everything that you do and have done. And hopefully continue to do Absolutely. for the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. So thank you, Rosanna. Always a pleasure. So Rosanna writes, uh, hi, Paul. This is the fun fact below. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest star of all? Since beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the answer to that question could definitely spark a long-lasting debate. One contender, through though, could be the star with almost a mirror name, Myra. Although, if you favor the Indian or Spanish pronunciation, it sounds more like Mira. But either way, the Latin meaning for Mira, which can be a shortened version for Miranda, is amazing and astonishing. So, uh, um, so and, th and this certainly is. So this is Mira. This is a pulsating red giant star, which is that red one in the center. And uh, near minimum light as photographed through a telescope. And this was actually from the 20, uh, 2018. Uh, uh, Art Travina was the person who took this photograph. So she begins to explain on this photograph, Mira A and Mira Sita, or as it is sometimes called, uh, Omicron Sita, is more than just a great star to seek out in the constellation Cetus. She was the first recorded variable star other than Nova, and her vari variability has been known since the 16th century when astronomers first began documenting her now you see me, now you don't act. The recorded Mira A's peep show <laughs> from only naked eye viewing uh, in a systematic study in 1638, Dutch astronomer Fosilides Hallwarda, <laughs> yeah, discovered that the star disappeared and reappeared in a varying cycle about every 330 days. So uh, see pulsating picture attached below, which we will. So let me just move on to the next slide. With telescope Mira A was confirmed to be a double, with, with Mira A being the larger member, a red giant star and her companion Mira B, uh, a white dwarf, the compact remnant of the star's core. So there are no ordinary, they are no ordinary pair. Together they form a symbiotic star system. And we're riding shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> so Mira B is uh, mercilessly, 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 that's a hard word, consuming gas from its neighbor Mira A. So if you zoom in on, you can see the powerful plumes of gas spiraling towards Mira B. I'm going to show you that image and I'm going to blow that up. There we are. So this, uh, the one on the right, of the left rather, is from the Chanda X-ray, uh, and this other one on the left is actually an illustration. So, um, so you can see the powerful plumes of the gas spiraling toward Mira B, creating a circuit or frisbee, like the structure around the white dwarf, which of course would be this section right here. Um, this type of settled gas layer is the sort of environment in which planetary systems can form. Mira A is also flying through space at 130 kilometers a second. We can watch the stellar burnout through ultraviolet cameras on space telescopes with a huge stream of hot gas extruding from Mira A, looking like a tail of a comet. Now, this tail stretches more than 100 
100, just a second, let me show it to you. Uh, 100, one more time maybe, that's a small picture, there we go. There it goes. <clears throat> so this tail stretches for more than 100 billion kilometers into space. Now, Mira A is also profoundly unstable, under, uh, undergoing such uh, oscillations as to occasionally adopt a potato shape. As the star transforms, it brightness it varies by a factor of 15 times. So, like many unstable theatrical stars of stage acts, Mira A will eventually disappear for good, but for the rest of our lifetimes, or, no, we'll disappear for good for the rest of our lifetimes, but we'll be able to follow her show. And Mira A's act will return to a scope near <laughs> you in 330 days. <laughs> and that is this week's... Rosetta's Fun Facts. Hey! hey. hey. They're always so good. Oh, I love it. I love it. Thank you again, Rosanna. Awesome job. Absolutely. There we go. Great to get that information. Hey, another out. amazing fact from Rosanna. Her stock is just unbelievable. That's incredible. She spends yeah. a lot of time at it, I'm sure. She does. We got uh, some photos to go through. Um, seen here on Facebook. Hey, did you guys hear anything about that solar flare hitting Earth? Well, I guess that's the one that we were supposed to. If they're talking about the uh, Aurora, um, the CME that was coming in our direction uh that one didn't the one that we looked at the other night apparently was the one that was uh, released back on the 26th uh partly uh, the one part of the one uh, from the 28th uh missed us completely but if we're looking at the sun as a ball and it was 20 uh, ar 2887 i think it was the sunspot that was down at the bottom the bottom area the south pole of the southern half i'll say of the sun when it released that energy we're not horizontal to that spot or we weren't right so we didn't get the full burst we got something that was you know directed down this way and we got what was left over of it so that's why the show didn't turn out as nice as what was planned and they they didn't they can't predict this stuff as far as the speed goes for what it's going to leave the sun usually they they travel at about a million miles per hour and the sun's 93 million miles away so it takes about four days to get here but sometimes when they release a large cme they'll they'll that solar stream will will leave a lot faster sometimes up to two million miles per hour but they don't know exactly we don't have anything that's looking at the other side of the sun either to tell us what's going on right so we're just looking at the side that we're seeing so it's there's a lot of variables there it's almost like predicting the maritime weather there's a lot of things in there that can take part that uh, or that can take place and even when they got to just about the time that it was supposed to be they were still saying hey it's going to be a kp of seven and it only showed up as a five and, you know so i think on max we got last night was kp of five they did say seven but but then they said i saw the report today that it was supposed to be between six o'clock and nine o'clock tonight that the second wave was supposed to arrive so whether it did or not i don't know I, I have a difficulty posting that information because it's it's such a crapshoot. You know, you really don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. Like like life is like a box of chocolates. <clears throat> Never know what you're going to get. So you you just have to go with it. But I think a lot of people get out anyway and had a look at the night sky, so it was kind of nice. So. Okay, so let's get to a few photos that we got though. Anyway. Um. So let me try to share my screen. Just want to make sure I'm sharing it. And you should be the first ones to pop up. Oh yeah. Okay, so we're good. Love this so let's take a look. Here. Oh, that's goodies, yeah. 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 Right. And look at I got I got this program working. There you go. Hey. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got this from Trudy. Uh, here's a couple of photos. She said the moonlight photo, uh, waxing gibbous moon was at about seventy nine percent. Up here, yeah. Wow. Nice. Fantastic. Moon. Well done. Did she say where she took that? Uh, she didn't, but she might be on here to say. I love that image. That is so nice in so many yeah. ways. Yeah, very nice. Uh, Star Trail photo is a stack of 125 photos, she says. Uh, the wide white line Ooh, to the right. Beautiful. Wide white 
the wide white line to the right of center top is the Pleiades. Must be right here. Yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic, eh? Yeah, very well done. Over the lake. I mean, look at that. Yeah. Think about that for a second. I mean, yeah. she she not only got the star trails, but she got the amazing reflection. I mean, that's yeah. That's amazing. That's a, that's really good work. I want to hand it to Brad Kraft, who who gave me who gave me the idea for this uh, software. So thank you, Brad, for that. Um, it seems to be working better. Uh, yeah. Jeff Legere sent these in. He says, Friday night's viewing session until the clouds rolled over at midnight. He got uh, M29. Oh, uh, yeah. Mel 222. M39. And M34. All open nice. clusters. Yeah, nice job. Wow. Well How done, did he Jeff. capture? He didn't, uh, he didn't reveal that. I'm not sure what he's, what he's using. Almost looks like a, a telescope and an uh, uh, eyepiece projection. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 Nice work. Uh, Stefan Picard sent this one on. Uh, went out uh, last night, he said, to see if I could catch Aurora. I took about 60 shots from the top of a mountain in the Hammond River area of Quispam Sist near Damascus. While taking various shots from northwest to northeast, I realized that the Pleiades had just come up uh, just a couple of degrees right to, of the northeast. To the left, you can see Bright Capella, which is a very interesting star to observe. As it twinkles, red, blue, yellow, and white. Sure does. Yes, that sir. That nice. has had so many UFO complaints or, or calls to the uh, RCMP yeah. about UFOs because it, it flashes so many uh, so many different colors. I'm not sure if the glow in the distance past the initial low clouds or aurora as I looked it up uh, via satellite app and uh, it indicated I was aiming towards Titusville, Upham, and Salt Springs area, away from city or town lights. Hampton would be well outside to the left of the frame, shot at north-northeast. Hard to say. My settings were ISO 3200, f3.5 for 15 seconds on a 28 millimeter lens at, a, at an infinity focus. So yeah, there may be some in there. It's, it's difficult to say. Yeah. It just wasn't the storm that we were we were really hoping for. No. And but still, maybe, though, nice, uh, nice lady. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll uh, get an opportunity uh, hopefully later. There you uh, are. There you go. This is another one. Wait, no, if I get these in order. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. I got to see who these were from. I oh, know we definitely didn't see that. No, we didn't. No. 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 Uh, I might have to exit out of this for a second. Just give me a second. But that's Orion in the trees there. <laughs> I got them in. I got the names here. See, I was rearranging yeah. things because I wanted to put pictures in a certain order. And uh, why I did that, I don't know now. Oh, these are from Bruce Kasuji. Yes, they are. They're from Bruce Kasuji. Okay, I got some moves here from Bruce. Very nice. Okay, uh, uh, Chris, uh, mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff commented that uh, those photos that he took with all those clusters. Right. He was using his reflector with a 10 millimeter eyepiece and the cell phone adapter. Right on. Oh, pop. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. These are from Bruce, but I don't have your notes, Bruce. I'm so sorry. I captured as many as I could, but he did. He was showing, trying to show us some Aurora anyway. They, oh, these were off the Facebook page, oh. I believe, too. So well, you got some Aurora there. He did, yeah. Get some Aurora. All right. Look at that. That's a beautiful. Moon. Yeah. Oh, man. Gorgeous. Well that's beautiful. Uh, Jamie sent these in. I got her notes here somewhere. There, hi, she says, uh, hi, Chris. I took this photo of the full moon on Wednesday night. This was uh, past week because we held a few pictures from last week because we didn't get a chance to show them for our 100th uh, show, right? So It's as full as it gets. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> wow. uh, afterwards, she said, I turned my scope to Jupiter and got to see the double transit. Oh, right on. Um, of that now here we are yeah double trans of io and callisto along with the io shadow by zooming in you can make out three dots on jupiter in the photo i can't really zoom in i don't th yes i can yes you can yeah yeah there you go yeah and i can see them too yeah. nice. Nice. well done nice. jamie yeah well done she's using the nice. stadium's job too so good stuff good for her well done okay uh who's up next i think it should be Carl. what's on first who's on second <laughs> <laughs> There it is. Here's Carl. Oh, nice. Carl. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Carl says, hi, Chris. Tried to send these by email, but message wasn't delivered. This was taken at Mount, Mount Katat, K-A-T-A-H-D-I-N. Katadin? Katadin. Katadin. New Hampshire? Uh, overlooking uh, in Patton uh, on Friday. No, in uh, Maine, I believe. Maine. Okay, yeah. And he said no aurora so far this weekend, but captured that, so that's awesome. Beautiful. Shot. Nice. Nice. you got to love the Milky Way. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so maybe get my other aurora. You know, yeah, this guy here. I don't know where this one came from. Where did that one come from? Oh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> purely experimental first run he says yeah oh yeah <laughs> heck of a first run <laughs> yeah heck of a first run by mr paul owen yes sir yeah lots of detail there buddy yeah it's uh it turned out quite nice it probably doesn't translate that well over tv screen but actually it doesn't yeah she looks bad or it looks good Not bad no it looks good yeah yeah it looks really good paul yeah well so done. um what that is is i just got a new uh, model camera first time I ever tried doing mono with uh, color filters. And um, so I just, there's no calibration frames or anything on that. That was just red, green, blue, and luminance and a little bit of uh, processing. And uh, that was my first light with that camera. And uh, I haven't shot Andromeda. What I was really surprised about from all of that is uh, the camera sensor size uh, and my telescope, because with the telescope I was using with the other camera I had, I had a smaller sensor. And I couldn't get all of Andromeda in it, but this one I can get all of Andromeda in it. This is so. This was this was a yes, treat. Yeah. 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 So, Very but nice. of course, orient it corner to corner. Uh, but yeah, so that's what that is. Yeah. Uh, first light with the I, new model camera. I'd say that's your best photo of Andromeda yet, Paul, for sure. Yeah, it's. I can't wait to actually start getting real deep into work on it, but. Mm. Um, oh, well, Andromeda. I mean, that was one of my first targets, right? Yeah. 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 The green blob. Yeah. <laughs> you had back in 2013. Come a, long, come a long way from there. <laughs> uh, let me get this one here. Uh, oh, this guy here. Yeah, this Mike. So Mike, well, I was going to say, was that yours or mine? Because we were both shooting the same thing. <laughs> That's yours. So we were down uh, at Tucker Park last night trying to capture the Aurora off in the other distance. But uh, this was Venus in our evening sky, and Venus was casting a shadow. Look at that. Yeah, when I first looked at it. Not a shadow, but a, moon, a light. Yeah. I thought it might have been one of the lights from the houses across the bay there, but then it was coming in between the houses. I went, wait a minute, that's Venus. <laughs> Lined right up with a, with a rock and everything. Yeah. yeah. That's a fantastic picture. So Venus, uh, yeah, lighting up the bay or the, the river there. So Amazing. Nice stuff. Hey, we saw some different satellites while we were out there, too. It yeah, was kind of. What time of night were you out? Uh, what, 8 o'clock? Yeah, 8 o'clock. Yeah, 8, 8 to 10, I guess. Yeah. But there were some tumbling satellites there, uh, and there were a few actually following. They looked like they were just uh, following the same path. Yeah. It's kind of like a hive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so into some of the Aurora pictures that I got. Um, this one here came from Ooh. Brad Perry. Ooh. Very nice. Uh, Brad said, I was able to get this about 50 kilometers north of Fredericton. Uh, to the Love the way eye. you just picked that tree in the center, too. Yeah. Wow. Uh, to, to the naked eye, he said, it was very faint. I, I found I was seeing the most activity around 820 to 825. So, so I mean, there are areas of the province that were getting it. And, uh, yeah, it was you nice. Know, and it, that's I mean, nice. that's that's what this stuff does, too. It doesn't just come in a big blob. It kind of, you know, comes in in waves and all mm -hmm. depends on it's interacting with our magnetic field. So, uh has to electrically charge particles and depending on where it, it's able to get through so that's still a very nice uh that's a nice shot yeah amanda marie uh says the sky was rather beautiful she said we went out for a lovely drive trying to be higher and find the magic but we did uh we did she said just without the aurora borealis <laughs> yeah. so, no but she got andromeda yeah yeah i see there Right in Cassiopeia there. and pointing right towards oh, Andromeda. Yeah, right there, right? yeah. No, down a bit, oh. right? Yeah, there's Andromeda, Andromeda right there. Down. Down, down. Oh, no, over to your right, Chris. Or oh, right there. Right there. 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 there yeah. it is, yeah. Down there in the bottom is, uh, I, don't, I don't know what that is. Perseus. That's not the double cluster. That's the double, yeah. And yeah, heading into Perseus. Perseus. Yeah, yeah, she Perseus. got a bunch of stuff there. Cool. She does. That's fantastic. Not bad, huh? Good shot, not Amanda. Thanks for sharing that. Wow. Um... You know, James Cleland saw some in Edmonston, he says, before the clouds oh. rolled in. Wow. Oh, man. Well done. Nice shot. You know, I wonder, I'm going to have to ask James if that is near. Um, there's an observatory 
close to him that's right around a mountain, something like that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he lives near that observatory. And I can't remember the name of it. I was up there. I took a drive into it one time. And, uh, and, and believe it or not, the people in that observatory go to Mount Carlton because the skies are actually darker. Oh, oh really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, that says something for Mount Carlton for sure. Yeah. Anyway, great image. Very nice. Yeah. Thanks, James, for that. Um, I got this one from Eric C. Robinson to Pet. Uh, she said, I'm on PEI, and here's my current views. This was last night from Argyle Shore. It's misty out and it's faint, but she said definitely something here. My phone doesn't do it justice. So what she was picking That's up over here in the distance, I think, was what she That's was cool. Saying. Yeah, so there were places yeah. that were getting it. Um, you know, not the display, again, that we were all expecting, but at least some people did get to see some of it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, this one's from I C uh, Alvaro uh, de la Cruz. And he was uh, on Indian Mountain Road. So where's that? I believe it's up past Moncton area, I believe. Oh, okay. Still, you got it. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Well, man, we never yeah, even came so close fast. to it. No, I know. Um, did it just skip St. John or something? I don't know. It could, could have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Everybody around us was getting it, but we weren't. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't like salt air, maybe. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> Uh, this one came from, uh, is this one from Sharon Peabody or is this from Tony Simpson? I think this one's from Tony Simpson. Yeah, um, Milky Way while waiting for the Aurora, take him with his iPhone. So look wow. what's up in the top corner, right? What's that? Look what's up in the top corner. Up in the top left. A dolphin. <laughs> there oh, it is. Delphinius, yeah. <laughs> Delphinius. <laughs> Delphinius. Yeah, yeah, rub it in. Yeah, yeah. It's there. It's there. It's there. Anyway, it's nice. Yeah. I love it. It's also the kite, by the way. Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or Job's coffin. Thanks, thanks, Tony, for that. These are uh, photos that people were taking and, and dropping them on the page last night. Uh, I didn't get a chance to. I apologize. I didn't get a chance to answer all the questions that were up there, comments, because I was trying to catch the aurora myself, and the yeah. phone was very bright and. As I answered three messages, five more come in. <laughs> so I just did, well, I, I know I can't keep up. So, Well, there's lots of anyway, color in this one. Yeah, this, oh, is, from, this is from Mary Craig uh, down in uh, St. Andrews. Look at the reds. So oh, she gets, she gets yeah, nice the red's color. so high. Look how high it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. She did okay. I mean, they're, they're St. Andrews now, too, see? so. Wow. Like I said, all around us. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Or the there, and, uh, There's another one there. Wow. Wow. Well, well, you can see the red streams going up and down. Yeah. Can you imagine what it would be like standing there just looking at those stars? Because, I mean, this is a long exposure, or yeah. relatively long. Yeah. Um, how dark it would be. That would be that's amazing. Yeah. The right to the horizon, too. We're so we're so lucky to be in this yeah. part of the world that we do get a chance to see, you know, dark skies. No, I mean, we, Mike and I were just down as far as Tucker Park. I mean, and the sky was pretty nice down there. We did have some, a yeah. little bit of CD Globe, but still not bad. No, yeah. it, was, it was a nice guy. He used to pick up Milky Way. And so. Um, and Sebastian uh, Caron put on this one. He said, anyway, it was a great night. <laughs> he said, he, you know, he couldn't uh, get the Aurora either, but he had it. Uh, had Where's that out? What did he say? He didn't, he didn't say where it was from, no. And uh, I I haven't looked up some of these uh, folks. These, some of them are new, too, to the page. So I love the reflections off the water, though. Yeah, oh, nice. man. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. And there's, uh, is that Cassiopeia right straight up? No. Uh, Oh, on the, uh, on the site. right there, I think. Above the tower. Oh, right here. Uh, maybe. I can't tell if it's that one, or maybe you're right, Chris. I think it was to the left, upper left. That's Cassie oh, would be oh, up here. there. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, nice shot. And very nice, yeah. Uh, Tim Libby sent these in. Uh, let me see where I get started here. Um, these are pics we're taking, looking at you. To do. I'm just reading this for a second. He's got some um, shots here. I'll get to the moon ones in a second, but I'll read what he had posted. He said, the moon pics were taken looking east to Minister's Island. I was trying to find Comet Leonard by using a 30-second exposure on my cell phone when I noticed the moon rising. Looking through the telescope, I saw the cupola on the barn silhouetted. I'll get to those in a second here. Let's move over to those now. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Cool, yeah. So I, I quickly awesome. grabbed my phone from my tripod and got a few pics. And then he says the bull is from the top of the weather. Oh, cool. From the top of the weather vane. Yeah, look at that. The cow jumped over the moon. Yeah, he did. <laughs> oh, that's the moon. moon. <laughs> that's good, so cool. Good stuff. No 
Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Tim out trying to capture mm -hmm. something last night too. So good stuff. Nice. Yes, sir. Well oh, done. Yeah. And then we got this one from David. David says, sometimes it's great to see the lights. Other times it's just great to look at stars. Yeah, so, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. I agree. The fact that you're out was the main thing. And I get this one from Andrew Hodges and Michelle Denise both. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I thought that was perfect. Oh, I got a good laugh out of that one. Yeah. That was... Oh, that's funny. <laughs> That's good. Anyway, I anyway. think it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if you have some photos that you'd like oh, to share so with good. us, we, we really enjoy them. So you can send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com or send them into SNAS, S-N-A-S, at astronomybythebay.ca. Either one of those. And uh, with that, I guess we'll close out our pictures. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we'll stop um, Emma show. did write uh, about that Indian mountain. Uh, okay. She, yeah, she said that was on the northwest of Moncton. Okay. And there used to be a great observing spot there, apparently. Well, I think, I think it's yeah. yeah towards Riverview, I think, on that area, possibly. Yeah, yeah, northwest of Mountain. So. Northwest, yeah. No, so no Riverview would be, be the other way, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, it'd be up by uh, old Magnetic Hill area that that way. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, Google map on that. Time. <laughs> Salisbury <laughs> Steak Place. <laughs> <There you go>. <laughs> <laughs> Salisbury Steak Place. <laughs> Oh, very uh, steep. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for the photos. And, uh, you know, there are more sunspots coming around. <coughs> There's a huge one right now, AR2891. Don't know what's going to happen with it. I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> but it's in the top uh, section, the northern hemisphere, I'll call it the sun. And if it breaks, it, it's actually moving across the sun now. It's going to take about two weeks to get across. Be about another three or four days. It should be somewhere uh, facing us. Now, facing us might mean this facing us or it might mean this facing us or this way so we really don't know right but when i mean and that and that might not it has already uh, released a few x-class solar flares so that's that's a, a good sign that it's very active and there's another bigger one coming behind that again around the corner so this is like a really active minimum, oh. solar minimum here is just i mean we're coming out of the solar minimum but six seven sunspots on the sun at the same time and we're not even you know part way to maximum yet so looks like it's going to be a good uh, good cycle Mm -hmm. Just make sure you get lots of cash when the, all the uh, power lines go down. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff your pillow full of cash. And um, a good hydrogen alpha scope. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in closing then again tonight, uh, our special thanks once again for your continued support. Uh, thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her uh, contributions always. to our show as always. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Also, thank you to all of you who contribute, continue to share our program with others. It is the only way we can get this show out to everybody else is when you share it. Uh, sometimes it just takes a little click, but uh, it's really helped a lot on the page. I should announce too that we just reached twelve thousand followers on Facebook. So yeah, woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! very happy with that that happened last night. So um, anyway, uh, want to thank uh, everybody who's been sharing it. Uh, Trudy, of course, our most faithful sh uh, uh, share. Trudy Allman, the NB Storm and Weather Center, who shares it. Lisa's Look Up, and many others. Tom Raithby. There's been a bunch that have been sharing it for us. I uh, remember too, we do love getting your photos, so send them into Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com and we will be happy to put them on our next broadcast or just put them on a Facebook page. Uh, have an idea for a future show? Just let us know and please let your family and friends know as well that we are here uh, every Sunday night to help entertain and educate. <laughs> entertain, probably mostly. <laughs> and, Something like that. Yeah, on the nice guy. So for now, then, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, please stay safe, everybody out there. Uh, we wish you all clear skies, and as we like to say, guys, keep your scopes. Point it up. Point it up. Point it up. All right, cue the music. <laughs> oh, I got a mask. Hey, yeah, I got a mask. <laughs> Everybody.
Have a great week. See you next week.